Hey everyone, welcome to the Wick Media Podcast. Today we have singer-songwriter Neil Murray with us. Nice to see you, Neil. Good to be here, Daniel. Now, there's no other non-Indigenous singer-songwriter in Australia that uses Indigenous language like you do. Why do you think that is, Neil? You sure that's true? <laughs> yeah. There must be somebody. Well, um, Paul Kelly. When did he use language? Yeah, I can't. I know the song. I can't. I should have checked up on that. I think there's been probably others, but um, oh, <clears throat> but yeah, because um, well, basically because I was in the Warrantry band, we were doing some songs in language, and yep. because I, one of the jobs I had at Papunya was a working in bilingual education program, which was teaching kids to read in their own language first, at least to get the concept of reading before going on to oral English, which I still think is the best way to teach reading and teach it to kids in their, in their mother tongue. Absolutely. And I got quite proficient at writing the language down. I had a really good teaching assistant, a woman by the name of Narabrai Nakamura, right. who taught me all the language I, I know and I understood her the best. Um, and I, I started to just really appreciate the window that language affords it gives you a window into the culture into the world view and i started to realize that the languages of this continent are the same intellectual treasure of the continent the languages carry all that and um yeah yeah just got an appreciation for how they arose from different countries and how they reflect that country and the, the culture of the people in it Sure, that's right. Um, and so what, what language was it that you learned uh, first? Literature. It's called literature. Mm. It's very similar to Pijanjara or Pinibi. It's more Pinibi literature. There's a few different preferences, pronouns. Pijanjara mob use, often use picture as the going, the word verb to go, whereas literature uses uh, anani going. And, yep. uh, but if you can understand one of those Western Desert languages can pretty much get by with, between Port Augusta and up towards Broome, around Alice, pretty much. Uh, Walpree's very different, but there's some similarities. But, um, I probably wouldn't describe myself as fluent. I was certainly like kid's ability. I could work out mm. what was going on and I could make um, reasonable responses and explain simple things, what I wanted to do. I, I would have trouble explaining the solar system, but it should be possible. If you're fluent, fluent in any language, you should be able to explain a concept like that. Mm, absolutely. Mm. That's right. And that's why it's so important that we keep those languages as strong as we can. Oh, yeah. There's, there's language retrieval going on everywhere. I, I mean, part of my journey was you know I wanted to be with Aboriginal people learn from Aboriginal people because they know this land the best and I wanted I wanted to I saw that they really belong they really come from this land and I wanted to share and that I wanted to deepen my own sense of belonging I felt that they could mm. they could show me and they did and part of that journey was then looking back at the country where I was born and raised which is Japaron country in Western Victoria mm. and of course everything's been lost down there in a big way in terms of it was much of South East Australia was brutally dispossessed in, in the mid-1800s mm. and um, there was much devastation of people and land and culture. But nevertheless, I, I took it on myself at the prompting of people like Sammy Butcher telling me, that's your country, you should go there, sit down there, you know. So I did, I came back and... And so I started to research the language. I had um, a local elder, uh, Uncle Ted Lovett, just casually standing next to me at the, on the shore of Lake Bolak one day and he just remarked seemingly into the air but in my earshot I'd like to hear a song in Japaron I said so would I and he looked at me and he said go on then <laughs> so that was the mission it took me a couple of years um, there's very little records of Japaron there's probably half a dozen full scap pages there's some word lists a lot of grammatical uh, information is, is missing Yep. But we can infer by what's left of neighbouring languages uh, a lot. And then I had Professor Barry Blake and another linguist, Julie Reed, give me a bit of a hand. Yep. Uh, Professor Barry Blake, uh, he was uh, 
expert on Western colonial languages, which is part of them. So I managed to come up with a song, which I recorded. Wow. It's called Malamie Long Ago. Not sure if it's totally correct, but it's it's close enough, and I, f I feel that, you know, I just wanted to make some honour the old people somehow. And um, Sure. Then again, you find that down in Southeastern Australia, very people are very predictive of what they have still, you know, remains or various language groups are involved in researching and, and retrieving their, they call, they say they're buried, they're not lost, they're just buried. Yeah. So sometimes out of my own area, you've got to sort of step warily because I've, best intentions can be misconstrued. Um, I did actually try and write a song in, in a neighbouring language and I was told fairly uh, forthrightly that uh, to, to butt out. Wow. <laughs> so, all right. Wow. Even though I was just going to gift it to people to use as a, yeah, as a, a, as a choir. That's how strong the possession is. Yeah, they just felt that I was going to exploit it somehow, and that wasn't my intention. Yeah, and I even had a, a linguist or an undergraduate linguist who would, had uh, ancestry of that language group. Yeah, he just said you're going to have to take it to the board. There's a language board that they decide. People often want to use words for businesses and stuff, and they decide whether it's appropriate or not. Yeah, yeah. So I just had to respect that. Although I did felt I was misunderstood, and they didn't know me. Yeah. So that's the reality in South and Eastern Australia, but in the northern parts of the country, if you you, lo you learn anyone's language, they put you on a pedestal. Absolutely. And they tell everyone, "Don't talk English to him. He's really unlaw." <laughs> talk literature, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's great because, because that's how you learn yeah and <coughs> excuse me. It's, it's a respect because they've had to learn English and they picked up English quicker than any Europeans picked up their language yeah correct so to go the other way is it, a mark of real respect yeah and people uh, it changes your relationship yeah people see you differently you're not just a tourist on the surface you're someone that's willing to listen and learn yeah and really be with people yeah that's really a special place to be, hey? Yeah, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know. Well, I've experienced <laughs> a similar yeah. ex um, life up in the Cape, hmm. learning Wickbook and yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, there's probably only about five outsiders who speak Wickbook and who've even made an effort. Wow. It's incredible, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's a beautiful mm -hmm. language. It's so beautiful here. They all are, especially... They sure are, yeah. To utter them or to hear them spoken in the language they come from, they resonate powerfully. Yeah. That's, That's why a good way to put it. If yeah. we can restore the original names for places, and I think that's fantastic, because they all had names, you know, and these imposed yep. names by the colonists um, are, are an intrusion and they're a distraction, and they sure. um, we need to really they're beautiful names, you know, and we need to put them, get yep. them back. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's something we spoke about in the last podcast. Gimoy is the traditional name for Kant. Gimoy. Gimoy. Yeah. It's right. a tribe too. I already found that out last time I okay. did a discussion like this. So mm -hmm. it's much to learn. So um, can we just change the subject a little bit now? Um, in uh, 2009, you produced the album Tungu. Jungo. Jungo. Jungo means Thank all you. in one joined together. That's a literature word. Jungle. With Sammy Butcher, yeah. an ex-member from Burumpi. Uh How did you get started on that project? Well, Sammy was the first person. Well, he was the one that came to me. I'd, I'd only been in Papunya for a week in 1980, and he must have heard, oh, this is new white fellow, he's got a guitar. Yeah. So he came around to see me and knocked on the door, and he was a cool-looking cat even then, you know, handsome young bloke. Yep. He said, you got a guitar? I said, yeah. He said, show me. So I showed him the guitar. And mm. boy, could he play. Mm. Just effortless. Mm. Brilliant natural talent. I said, we've got to jam, you know. Yep. So we, we started playing, jamming together, and then young fellas, his brother turned up with an upturned flower drum with a couple of twigs and just started keeping the beat, you know. Yep. And um, fellas, sit down, on sit-down money, dole money, they chucked in money, we got a bit of gear, you know. Started playing covers at first, you know. Yeah. So that's kind of Sammy's in, got a wonderful, generous, inclusive spirit, you know. Mm -hmm. So he kind of drew me in, you know. Wanted me to. He, wants, he always shares everything, you know. People to be involved, you know. Yeah. So anyway, um, 
without going further in the history of the Warrabee band, but that's, it's, it was always him, me and him kind of coming together created this thing. And sure. It was a wonderful energy playing with him. You really, it was just exciting. And um, yeah. So after the Warrabee band was done and dusted, like we officially retired in 2000, but we did do a couple of gigs after that. We played the Dreaming Festival in 2006, and that was the last time we ever played with the lead singer because yep. I noticed then that he was struggling. Um, he wasn't well then. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, of course. Mr. Rombu? Yeah, he, he passed away the following year, 2007. Yeah. Um, so any any prospect of doing a, another warranty band project um, disappeared with him, really. Sure. But Sammy was still there, and um, I thought, I'd just love to go out and see him and see if we could... He was always a great one to give me ideas, spark ideas, whether from right. jamming or from a story you told me. Yeah. You know, I just, I just would listen. He just had a way of telling a story or saying something. So, ostensibly, we were doing a bit of mentoring, but uh, got a little bit of funding from the uh, NT Arts or something, and went out there to sit down for a few days. And and he was very busy. Uh, then he was, um, he doesn't drink or smoke, and so he's a sought after community leader. And he, yep. there's always meetings, meetings, meetings. You know. Yeah. And he was here, there, and everywhere like a, a blowfly, but. He'd sort of come around in the morning and tell me a yarn or maybe pluck a few chords, you know. I mean, I remember this one song, Fine Open Country, which is the opening track of the album. Right. He, he just hit the C chord and he started picking and he just had the one the first line. He said, I was standing alone in Northern Borough watching the sun go down. And that's all he had. And he took off. And so I just had that. <laughs> wow. And by the time he came back in the afternoon, I had this song. Yeah. I said, what do you think of this? And he goes, incredible. Number one, you know. So <laughs> that I just love the way he could spark me. And that mm. first trip out, they hadn't been out there for decades or you know, more. And I was there for four or five days, and I couldn't believe it. I just had songs coming out of me everywhere, you know, and all from his little ideas, sparks, you know. And it's yeah. like he give me a spark, and I'd have a little fire going by the time he came back in the afternoon or something, you know. Yes. And um, and I thought, geez, what can we do with these songs? Like. I think I came out again the following year and got a few more. And I said, we should try and record them. I was kind of, <clears throat> I was wanting to do something to help him too, because he was kind of musically in the wilderness. Earlier on, he'd, he'd done his own solo record, guitar instrumentals. Okay, I don't know about that one. Yeah, it's, I think it's called Desert Surf Guitar. Right. That wow. was done oh, cool. know, probably in the 90s. Yep. But he'd been heavily involved with mentoring his sons and nephews band, the Chuppy Band, right. which was a desert reggae band. Yep. And they'd become... They were very good. Yes, and some of them well are known, yeah. really good. Yeah, and I don't know. I just felt I felt I've always felt um, a lot of indebtedness to Sammy. Somehow, he's he's got me out of some sticky situations at times, <laughs> and I just wanted to do something with him, and that I felt would be good. So I got talking to Jim Magini, who's been a long time supporter of my music. Yep, and he expressed enthusiasm and wanting to get involved and, and help. You know. Yep. So um, we started a, a crowdfunding campaign to get some money to do a little recording. And wow. One thing led to another. We, we had um, the Mixmaster's studio, Mick Wordley's studio in Adelaide Hills, booked. Yep. Some of were supposed to come down, and me and Jim were driving across from Victoria. And the last minute, Savvy said, oh, I can't come at Papunya Sports Weekend or something. I said, Oh, God, what a blow, you know? But then I thought, oh, we'll keep going. You, me and you, Jim, we'll just do some beds for him, yep. and then get him on after. Yeah. So we did that. We did we did the basic beds for the tracks, and and um, but in that shortly after that, he um, he had the first of three strokes. Oh no! He was in hospital and it was disastrous, and uh, and it he it impaired his right hand. Yep. And I thought, oh dear, was it all lost? You know, I, I sort of was thought oh, we're not going to be able to do this now yeah but um jeff mclaughlin in tenant creek uh knew sammy well and had some studio gear and he got him there and managed to get a bit of him on guitar he was, he was playing one-handed virtually hammering on yeah uh he still had the musicality and he he got some recordings done and then jim and i went up to alice and we got him in the studio there uh, bill davis's studio and 
Yeah. We managed to get get some more of him, but just set him up so that he could play with the guitar on his lap and sort of almost like playing a piano. He was like this, and he, he could hit it a bit with his right hand, but was, he couldn't coordinate it very well. Yeah. But we got enough stuff there that... And we also got his vocals on a few tracks too, which was a coup, because he doesn't ever saw himself as a singer. Yeah. And then we got his niece to sing on a few tracks, and she's got a beautiful voice, Crystal. Yeah. And Jim took it all back to his studio in Brookvale in Sydney, and he spent hours editing and compiling and whatnot. Sure. Got it together, and we we got a bit. We again, we had some wonderful uh, people who donated some some uh, funds so that we could get it edit mixed properly and mastered and mastered yeah so we ended up with with the album jungle which is it's got a you know a pretty warm sweet sounding record really yeah i've had a listen to uh waiting for sammy yeah yeah <laughs> and um i said to you earlier when we were talking it made me laugh when i heard the heard it for the first time yeah but you said it was a serious song yeah. oh yeah but i often remember waiting we're often waiting for sammy you know because <laughs> yeah. he's one minute he's there and then he's not or he said he's coming but then he's not you know how what, what it's like and and in a way there's a there's a bit of sadness in that song for me though um i don't know but um when he when he was in had the first strokes and was in hospital i was in Broome that time and we were really concerned we, we didn't know what was going on so i actually played that song live in Broome on the evening that i heard that he'd had the strokes yeah but um yeah, and the first time I got the idea and I played it to him, he said, oh, I like that song, Waiting for Sammy. He, he really liked it. I think he liked the fact that his name his was His name was in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's yeah. beautiful, mate. Yeah. Okay. Um, in uh, 2005, you were involved in the Lake Bollock Eel Festival. Have I said that correctly? Yes, you have. Um, and it was set up as a contemporary celebration upon Indigenous traditions. Can, oh, there's a lot to talk about. Can you give us a little bit of a rundown on how it got started, please? Sure. Well, part of my return to my own country was to try and find out, find, um, make connection with people I didn't, know about who are descendants from the area that survived and they're all around the Framlingham area. I can remember being at high school in Lake Bolick in the 70s and I'm thinking back now there was a handful of kids who were obviously of indigenous descent but mm. nobody said anything about it then. Yeah. Nothing. Except for one guy in, in Form 4 he's, one, one day he said to me just conspiratorially you know I kind of whispered he said hey. I said what? He said I've got a black fella in me. I said, have you now? That's great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was the only guy who said it. But um, I started to realise on my travels, because I've asked various Aboriginal people, because they ask you where you're from and stuff. Yeah. As early as 1979, when I was teaching at Robinvale on the Murray River there, near Mildura, I met a Wiradjuri man who asked me where I was from, and I said, oh, I didn't know any black fellas from my own area. He said, oh, he said, you want to go see Uncle Banjo? Yeah. He'll sort you out, you know. <laughs> so yeah. I'd heard of his name, his Uncle Banjo, you know. Yep. And, um, and when I first heard about Archie Roach, that was another revelation, hearing yep. about him. And I said, how come I didn't know him? Well, I didn't because he'd been taken away. Yep. But I vaguely remember hearing about Framingham. It was about three quarters of an hour drive south of Lake Bolick. And it had been a, a mission or reserve established in 1865. And remnants, the people who'd survived the frontier wars, we're all pretty much gathered there. I either gathered there or at Lake Conda further to west. And any descendants of Japarong people or Karaderong people from my own area uh, would have would have ended up there. Yeah. And um, and I was talking to Archie one time. I said, "Oh, if there's ever a gig down country, you know, down that way, I'd love to." He said, "Oh, I think they're going to do something. They're going to have a back to." So in 1993, they did. They had a concert in Warrnambool. Right. So this was my opportunity to meet Uncle Banjo. Yeah. And I made it, I rang him up, you know, and said, oh, this, my name's Neil Murray, you know. I'd like to have, come out and have a yarn. He said, yeah, no worries, bud. Come out the road, Wangoom Road, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah. And uh, finally got to, to meet him. And it was revelatory because he just seemed to accept me. Me, even though I look, I'm a white fella, he accepted that my English sure. was genuine and I really wanted to know what happened to people yes. in that area. You know, I was really... I had a lot of anguish about it, you know, because I, I suspected, you know, 
terrible things happened and they did you know? yeah they did and I, but he just took me to the local cemetery and showed me where the, all the old people were buried in unmarked graves you could see the gentle undulating on the ground and yeah somehow all my questions just went out of me kind of purged me somehow and wow. I spent I only knew him for seven years before he passed but I'd often go to his place and just sit taking a bit of tucker or something and he'd just sit around and we just he'd just tell yarns and I'd just listen to these yarns he told you know and they, all, they always yeah. had a teaching element to them sure you know and um, so he became the elder I'd yearn for in my own, my own area wow you know? wow and coupled with that I'd ret- after that in, in 1995 I managed to move it back out uh, to Lake Bolick, which was the nearest town from where I was raised on a farm, my grandfather's farm, yep. soldier settlement block. It was actually my great grandfather's soldier settlement block from the First World War. Okay. And of course, you know, I, I was to learn that Indigenous uh, returned servicemen never got offered a block, you know. That's and right. even my parents didn't know that that was going on. And they were horrified to hear that, you know, or was any decent person would be. That's an injustice. Absolutely, you know? it is. So I think that thing, a lot of those things were going on and the main stream population was, was in the dark about it, really. Yeah, that's right. So there's a few families down that way are still pursuing compensation cases to this day because wow. of not getting a, a block of land that wow. they, they were owed from being, you know, so serving in the armed forces overseas. Yeah, yeah. In those wars, First World War, Second World War, whatever. But, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, all that aside, I still had a deep yearning to try and connect with people. And I, I just had this, I just, the absence of people from the country really haunted me. And I wanted to, what can we do about that? I, 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 I had this idea of walking in, in the land, mm. walking with people back through the ancestral country mm. that they'd been removed from. So I floated this idea with Uncle Banjo's family because he'd be passed on by then and they were all supportive that we're going to walk from the mouth of the Hopkins River and follow the the river upstream and then up the creek to Lake Bollock the way young eels would travel to get to the inland lakes. Yeah. Because the whole thing about Lake Bollock in um, pre-colonial times, it was, it was a site of a gathering that happened every year after the autumn rains Yep. That would, the lake would overflow, and that's when the eels would be trying to migrate, get to the sea. Yes. And that's when uh, the local clan that had jurisdiction over it would, everyone would be invited in. You'd have up to a thousand people camp there for several weeks. Yeah. Doing all the business of the day. The, 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 Having big eel feasts. Yeah, yeah. They thought all the families could put a trap in right down the, the outlet, and everybody could get a feed, and uh, it was. A, even now, Kuyang or Punyat, as the language names for it, is still the most favoured fish for people that way. It's very nutritious and they're easy yep. to get. Yep. And they used all this hydrology and stuff. I mean, budge bims down there, they've got all that going now as a tourist attraction now. Yeah. So anyway, we organised this walk and I remember starting there and we had um, Uncle uh, Banjo's son and, and daughter involved and some of his grandsons and that. And we walked, to, we took eight days, but we walked all the way up to Lake Bolak as if we were traveling overland going to the gathering. And I just envisaged wow. having a little campfire on the beach and having a sing song. Yep. But by this stage, there was like-minded people in the district, um, non-Indigenous people, but they, they liked, liked the idea of having a proper festival, you know, with a marquee, you know? Yes. So that's what happened. Stage. And uh, we had like a thousand people turn up to the first one and um, wow. all these artists played and we had dancing and stuff. The first time there'd been, you know, any kind of um, corroboree there, <laughs> probably 150, 200 years or something. But wow, um, gives me goosebumps thinking about so that, bro. It, w- it was important to have a festival inspired by gatherings from pre-colonial times because you you need to keep those links, those deep connections. You know, Absolutely. something felt right about it. And the only one, <laughs> other one I've heard in, of in Australia that's similarly inspired is the Bunya dreaming thing. Yep. It happens in Gubby Gubby country, in the sunny coast, because they used to have gatherings for the bunya nuts, you know. That's right. And I've spoken to Beverly Hand about it, and they've had revived that again too. And they don't have it every year, though. But Sure. And we only have the Eel Festival now every two years anyway. Sure. It's a lot so that nice. was that, these activities <coughs> made it were profoundly meaningful for, for me and it seemed to validate my return to my own country, you know. Absolutely. So, wow. yeah, uh, and we did walks every year for quite a while for, uh, along various stream systems in the area 
uh, quietly kind of we were walking through a lot of damaged land from industrialised farming but we still found a lot of things a lot of evidence indigenous occupation scar trees all the rest of it stone uh, fish traps and things yep. and we just felt everyone was inspired by it and we just had a small group up to 16 no more than 18 people and there's usually two or three um, indigenous people walking with us as well but we had just yep. a lot of other like minded people of all walks of life who, who wanted to just come and and just the act of walking and in country and then we had a couple of support vehicles taking away gear, food and everything. Yep. And just like getting just gets getting into the land and, and walking it and, and not like a bush walk, you know, stomping around, oh look at that great view but a different kind of walking. Yep. We're actually yep. following ancient pathways because all those stream systems were like highways, you know, people walking up and down. Yep. Um, they're often borders between clans and stuff and sure and we just felt I don't know I just felt deeply moved and I got a couple of songs out of those those activities but, but it was an attempt to really try and connect in a deeper way to the yeah. land yeah and we got blessed Uncle Banjo and I mean not Uncle Banjo Uncle Ted Lovett used to send us off with a blessing and welcome to country and wow that's powerful uh, yeah and um, we walked downstream from the, the mountains where the fiery creek Rose and all the way to Lake Bolick. We did that a couple of times. Yep. We've done the Warren River. We did the Mount Emu Creek. Uh, yep. We did the Hopkins River over two or three different <clears throat> years, doing different sections. And yeah, it's a really powerful when you have the elders with you. Yes, and yes. And like, <clears throat> and you actually dwell. You got to learn to listen and dwell in a place. Yeah. You know. You do. And um, it's it's really about taking notice. Yeah. Um, and. It's the same principle in a way. I mean, even when I told Sammy, well, all the language and laws been lost in my area, he sort of said, oh, you can pick that language up. I thought, shit, can I? <laughs> I don't know how. But yeah. it's a, the premise is you go and sit down in country and you listen and observe and the land will teach you. Mm, that's it. That's how simple as that, it. isn't it? Yeah, really? but it, it is. It, it's simple as that. It's not easy. You have to spend a lot of time. That's years, right. Yeah, and that's yeah, why yeah, yeah. the deep knowledge that Indigenous people hold from generations and generations of, you know, very intimate engagement with their land and their environment is, is just so deep and precious, you know. It and, sure is. Um, and those are the things that need to be preserved. Uh, at all costs, you know, every time an old person dies, Sammy used to say, there's a library gone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And uh, just, it, it rem takes me back to going for the first time up the Cape and going out on country, and the elders would put smell on you up there. Mm. And for the people listening who don't know, the smell, they believe, is to let the spirits know that you're coming on country. Mm. So they'll put smell onto the outsiders so the spirits know who are there. And for me to go through that, it's, uh, it's such a beautiful experience. Well, it really let, is. to get those kind of blessings from traditional owners is, is the proper way to enter someone else's country. You know? Yeah, that's right. That's why um, I don't really go unaccompanied to tourist sites or things like that. Mm. I, I, I have been, but I always feel a bit awkward because I, I, I'd rather be with local TOs yeah. who can actually show me yeah. where to be, where to stand. Don't go that way. Stay here. Blah blah blah. Or we'll take you there. Or that is, that is the proper way to, to really, to go anywhere into somebody's home. You know. So yes, if you've had that, that's 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 the proper way to to be to enter. You know. Yeah, I mean. That's in, 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 I used to use this analogy. I mean, the whole country was somebody's home. There was multiple homes, multiple nations. And if you barge in and help yourself to the cupboards and ransack everything, it creates bad blood. But if you go up and knock on the door respectfully, mm. you wait, you know, someone comes out, oh, yeah. You say, oh, look, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, can you help me? They're going to help you, you know? Yeah, every time. You know, because you, you show that respect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even though there was... I had I had my in a relationship I was in. I had my mother-in-law come down from Top End 
And we couldn't speak directly because it's an avoidance thing, you know. Yes. But uh, Same through, with me. Through Same her with daughter, yeah, who yeah. was my partner at the time, uh, she especially interested in doing some weaving with grasses. Yeah. And um, so we drove around the lake to have a bit of a look. and She seemed to spot a sedge and said, oh, that looks all right. But then she said through her daughter, I can't. I can't get it, it's not my country. Mm. So I went out and got it and I cut it for her. Mm. That was all right. Mm. And I told Uncle Banjo that story and he just said, oh, it's beautiful to hear. It is beautiful to hear. He said, those old people have got that respect. Yeah. You know, yeah. even though she is from Topley and, and bottom end, you know. Yeah. St- even though there might not be any indigenous people there, spirits are still there, you know. Yes. And so. she observed that thing. So that was wonderful to see that yeah. yeah that's a beautiful story mm. shall we move on um neil um you're recognized as one of um australia's foremost songwriters by apra awards in 1995 by winning the song of the year with uh mile on home what did that mean to you getting that award oh it 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 was I guess um, um, I'm not one for awards, I'll say that, yeah. but, but that one is peer voted. It's voted for by the, the members of APRA, who are all composers, songwriters. Yep. So it, it, it was nice to get that recognition, you know, um, even though um, it, it happened because of the success of Christina Anu's version of the song. Yeah, which broke into the mainstream, and she had a machine behind her, the big record label and management promotion, all the rest of it. Yeah. Whereas the Warrenby Band had recorded it and released it as a single in 1987, it didn't have the same imp- impact, but it was an yep. immediate hit in all indigenous communities, yep. right out as far as Tahiti, you know. Wow. Yeah. You know. Incredible. So um, that it was validated by the mainstream industry was was. You know, it, it 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 was gratifying to get some kind of mainstream recognition for it. Yeah, but yeah. in a way, I would have. I felt the Warranty Band's version was better. should have been ner- not not better. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no, I just no. think it should. We would release it first. It's like a lot of things. We were the first at a lot of things. We were the first to release a commercial rock pop single in an indigenous language. You know. That's right. So uh, we were. You know, it's it's great to see that. Since then, there's a lot of artists now who are recording and releasing songs in their own language. Yeah, it's beautiful to hear. Mm. It really is. Um, so we, we'll move on again. Um, you've published two books, lyric, one of lyrics and one of short stories. Also, I did a, a poetry book with okay. uh, with Charles Darwin University Press yes. back in the late 90s, a book called One Man, one Man Tribe, which is out of print now. Right. Yeah. Okay, I went to the library and had a look, couldn't find any books. <laughs> um, and so this long-form writing, uh, why is that important to you? Uh, well, at the time, I, I was still struggling musically to get enough money just from doing shows, and I was living in Sydney. Yeah. And I had, I'd always written, I'd started writing poems the same time as I did songs, kind of, you know. Okay. Two aspects of the one coin, really, but... I hadn't written, I was doing some prose things and I showed them to a, a, a writer that I was friends with who lived in Balmain and he said, oh, this, they were called Hotter Headline at the time, Hotter and Stoughton and they were at the time and they had, they had a New Zealand guy who was their editor and he was very interested in publishing Australian stuff in inverted confidence. Yep. And he he took my short stories, whatever you call them to him, and he, he liked it and he said, can you... Any chance you could expand on these things and make a book out of it? I said, well, yeah, I could, yeah. Well, the thing was, they were going to give me an advance to write, so you beauty, you know, what better yeah. motivation. Yeah. Because it saved me trying to scratch around and get odd jobs, you know. Yeah. So I, I probably wrote wow. the first dra- draft in, I don't know, 92 or something. In um, I was living in Annandale in Sydney and probably wrote it in f- five, six months. And then they get beautifully had an editor to work with me and did some rewriting in three months. And I went up to wow. Varuna and Katoomba and I really enjoyed it, you know. And uh, then they published it, you know. Wow. And then 
at the publishers changed. I think they got taken over by someone else, and they became hot headline. Headline by that stage, I've moved to Melbourne in '94, and it might have been the. I ended up getting the rights back and a thousand books that they hadn't sold. Right. So I ended up selling those, and then it was out of print. But then a friend in Byron Bay kindly stumped up the money to get it reprinted with a different cover. Yep. Which happened. And, but, you know, I mean, I look at it now and I wonder how the hell I wrote it. I was sort of pretty brash and perhaps bold and overly confident or something. But I'm amazed that um, it seems like another lifetime when I see, see it now. But um, yeah. it is, I hate using that phrase, it's such a cliche, it is what it is. Oh, yeah, that but, one. But it gives an insight into the, the, it covers a period from the late 70s to the end of the 80s, really. Okay, so this is the poetry. No, this is the Sing For Me Countryman, the autobiographical right. novel right not with names changed yeah. can you get a copy of it anywhere well i've got a couple in my car <laughs> that's you before. might lend me one <laughs> I, I'm, i've got a that's few left that i've been selling at gigs that's all okay maybe i'll buy one yeah. and um the poetry book was just a, a collection of stuff i'd written from the late 70s through to you know late 90s and at that is out of print um I don't know whether it'll get it pre-published or not. And the, the lyrics was something I did with One One Day Hill publishers who are now defunct. But the trouble with the lyrics book is that it be immediately becomes out of date once you've done subsequent albums. So Okay, yeah. That, sure, um, sure. I've sold a lot of copies that I brought with me on this run, but I've still got some back at home. Okay, I will buy one off you. Which one? <clears throat> any any of your yeah. books okay well I've got one because you, you can't find them anywhere no that's it you can't. <laughs> but, but most libraries should have a country of should have a copy of Sing For Me Countryman at least the first edition okay because it was on their library uh, register thing and, okay I'll ask the library but yeah they do get they do walk I hear yeah people have had them and loaned them to people and they never see them again yeah and often I get wild eyed people with their hair all awry turning up at gigs with a dog-eared dusty thumb-eaten copy wanting me to sign it <laughs> and i say i'm not responsible for anything that happens to you you know <laughs> you know and they're saying i just we just drove you across the desert to see you you know <laughs> and i said what you know I, yeah, yeah. You get all sorts mate. i guess that book was influenced a, a bit by kerouac's um, on the road and other yeah, really? Of, wow. Other kinds of writing that, that I'd read in the 70s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was sort of um, driven by the need to be brutally honest as much as I could, mm. but still not telling everything to protect the innocent and the guilty, but enough there to, for people to know what was going on. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Um, and so... <clears throat> Excuse me. We were talking um, yesterday, and you were telling me that you have been writing um, a memoir. I do have an, another manuscript on the go. Yes, that I was did a lot of work on during COVID lockdown because I had time to. Mm. I ended up writing too much, mm. and then I was told had an appraisal of it. I was told it was too long. Had to cut it down. I tried to cut it down. Yeah, and it's it's sitting with a small publisher at the moment. I, Great, I'm waiting on their feedback. But uh, awesome. hopefully that that might go somewhere. I mean, otherwise I could look at publishing it myself, but then it's just vanity press and doesn't really get any respect or reviews anywhere. Yeah, right. Sure, so sure, sure. I, I can't really uh, say more than that at the moment. But yeah. it's, um, it's a proper memoir. It names names and things. And, uh, What's yeah. it all? Hmm. Yeah, What's yeah, all? yeah. Fair bit, as, but um, mm. as honest as you can be about yourself. Yeah, w <laughs> as, as much as I can be. Um, and, mm. uh, it deals with a lot of things that, that happened to me in Sydney and my time in Sydney, and then from there on, mm. and deals with my returning to country and yeah, those kinds of things. Uh, a lot of stuff about the walks I had cut out because it's just too long. Yeah, but. Uh, a little bit about them, but not. I, I sort of see that might could be another book is just doing the whole walk thing. Yeah, sure, um, sure. 
at the moment I'm touring and I'm, I'm gigging and I'm sort of sort of playing songs and I'm getting ideas for songs because when you're playing them you, you sort of stimulates that side of things so awesome. I'll be hoping to looking to maybe record another album later in the year if I can wow mm -hmm. fantastic I awesome. think I've got one more album in me. I say that every time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's been, um, well, when the last ones they were released in 2019, so it's it's getting on, you know. I've usually generally released something every three, four years, maybe five years. Yes. But yeah, so. I, I tried to have a look at, you, at your um, catalogue and it's, how many solo albums have you done? Is it nine? Uh, well, it depends on if you include compilations and yeah, live things and stuff. But sure, as far as original albums go, I'm just trying to count. Karma Crystal Clear, these hands, um, Dust, Wandering Kind, Go in the Distance, um, um, Overnight, uh, Witness, um, Pretty Thunder and Rain. Blood and Longing, and then there's Jungle, there's 10 already original yes. albums. Yes. And then there's a few compilations, yes. best of type things, and uh, a, live album, a live album that's out of print that I did with Shane Howard, just yep. the two of us. And, um, yeah, and I've got another compilation on the go called Hindsight Now, but I did release one, Sing the Song, I think it was called, of the ABC a few years back, and before prior to that I had another one. We have shock records. Yeah. So you know, there's at least ten. Yeah. Originals there. Plus, there's the three warranty band albums. So there's. Yeah, of course. There's thirteen albums of original songs. Yeah. Amazing, incredible to um, be able to produce that amount of work in that amount of time, Neil. Well, look, it's, really, yeah, it is. I don't know. I, I don't think I'm overly prolific. Sure. I'm just I hope that. You know, just trying. It's better to to release, you know, quality. Absolutely. But as a songwriter, you you get all these songs on the shelf, and the only way to clear them is to record them and release them somewhere. So then you can feel that you you're free again to maybe something new to come in. You know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, right. So you're on tour in um, in the north of Australia, eh? Yeah. Up in Northern Territory, I saw you doing some dates. Yep. And. Um, up at Atherton and down here in Cairns tomorrow night. So, with, with when you've got that many that much work to draw from, how do you put a set list together to do a concert now? Well, because I'm solo, um, that in a way dictates the kind of songs I can do well in a solo format. Okay, yeah. Um, but then you balance that with the need to put in some tunes there that people know, the ones that have got a bit of traction. So that means at least a couple of warranty band songs. Yeah, sure. And my best known um, solo songs. Yeah. But I tend to do the songs that I know I can perform well in a solo mode. You don't have a band to kind of have that impact that you can cover more other songs that are rockier, for example, or whatever. But yeah. So there's a, there's I've had a fairly a set but perhaps at least half of it is pretty set but then I vary the other half of it okay. uh, in terms of uh, yeah What's what I do on? and it depends also where it, where I am playing and if I've got any songs that might be relevant to that area or that yeah. audience yeah absolutely uh, and the fact that I've had Trudy Fatnana performing with me uh, since Mackay and she's been singing about Black Burning and stuff and that's her yeah Part of her heritage. She's also got Indigenous heritage as well from the Cairns area. Yeah. Um, that's informed some of the songs that I've wanted to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's it, really. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming and having a yarn today, Neil. It's been awesome talking to you, mate. Right. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, When's this going to air? Well, we can put it up tonight. <laughs> we? Oh, you're oh, well, doing it. I'll, I'll, put, I'll send you a copy and you put one on your YouTube channel. 
I don't know how to do that. I just, well, you must have a technical person behind I do. I've got a web person down in Sydney that does that for me. All right, I'll send a copy to them and as quick as we can get it moving, mate. Um, okay, well, thanks a lot, mate. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, cool. Cheers, mate.